Welcome to our eighth Japan Day and the first one we have hosted online. We had originally intended to hold the festival last year at the Liverpool Guild of Students, but had to postpone the event due to the pandemic. Our next full Japan Day will be at Liverpool Guild of Students next year in July 2022. We have hosted Japan Day as a major day-long event every two years since 2006. It usually attracts about 2,000 attendees and we hope we can reach a new audience with this shorter online festival. We have also hosted a number of online talks and workshops this year and will be organising more before the end of the year. Please see our Facebook and Instagram pages for details. As soon as it is appropriate to do so, we will host more in-person events. Today's festival will last until 5pm when Kaminari Taiko will close off the event and Japan Society Northwest Committee will thank you for attending. The running order and performance times can be viewed on the Japan Day Facebook event page. We will be starting at 1.15pm with an excellent shamisen performance from Lian Morgan. There will also be taiko drumming from Tengu Taiko, as well as lovely koto playing by Sumie Kent. For martial arts enthusiasts, we have Shotokan Karate Union. There will also be a unique performance of Enka singing from Lee Jenkinson. For those unfamiliar with the genre, Enka has been described as Japanese blues. Just before our final act, Kaminari Taiko, Catherine Parasarat, will be giving a fascinating talk about Kyoto's historic annual Gion Festival. I would like to thank all our performers and the committee for making this event possible. I would also like to thank Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation, not only for their support of this festival, but of many of our other events too. Japan Day features, as part of the 2019-2020 season of culture, organised by the Embassy of Japan in the UK and we are very grateful for the support we have received from the Embassy over many years. I hope you enjoy the event. Please get ready for Liam Morgan's Shamisen performance at 1.15. Thank you.
Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. I hope you're enjoying Japan Day online so far. So I thought I could film and edit this video all in one day. Um, I didn't choose to, but I've been very busy recently and uh, video editing is very hard. Um, if anyone wants to help me with that, uh, please get in touch in the future if you take pity on me and want to give me some video editing lessons. I've been staring at my own face all day, so here is a video of me playing the Kahan uh, with no head. Uh, which will probably be quite refreshing by the end of this video. The first song is my version of a song called, I believe it's called Shippu, by the Shibata siblings band. And I believe that either means strong wind or it's the name of a battleship. But um, because the kanji characters are the same, I'm not actually sure. No one's actually ever told me. So here's my version of it. I tried to be clever with this and uh, film two parts and actually play to myself, but I'd never done that before. And... I can't really edit videos, so here's just uh, me playing one version with uh, the audio recording of me playing the high up, the other part in the background.
This next one is one that a lot of people um, start with when they start learning uh, Tsugaru Shamisen and it's called Kuroishi Yosare. The next one I'm going to play is called Sugaru Jinku, and it should be known by anyone in the SOAS group. I think uh, you guys do a version of this, so uh, please enjoy my little version. The next song I'm going to play is called Ajigawa Sawa Jinku and it's the only song that I'm going to play today that actually uses the regular shamisen tune in Honchoshi. All the rest use a different uh, where the middle string is a raised up a tone. So here is Ajigawa Jinku.
for anyone that's seen me before, you definitely know this next song. It's a uh, Ringo Bushi, which is means Apple song. And uh, so this time I tried to add a cajon underneath, but once again, my uh, video editing skills don't allow me to show you both at the same time and keep the audio in time. Uh, so here's a new version of Ringo Bushi with a cajon. The second to last song here is uh, going to be a song by the black metal band Gorgoroth that has a name I can't pronounce. I think it's Progitans Upenbaring.
So this is going to be the last song from me, and this is the most well-known song uh, amongst the Irish Amazon players. It's the one that everyone plays in the tournament, so we play it every time, usually ends the show, I think. It's uh, John Garabushi, and it's always improvised, so it's always going to be slightly different. But here's uh, today's version. Thank you so much for watching everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Japan day. Hopefully we can meet up and I can play in person at some point. That would be great. Thank you everyone. Bye bye.
Tim, thank you very much for joining us today as obviously the, the chair of uh, JSNW, the Japan Society of the Northwest. So first up, um, could you perhaps tell us a little bit about JSNW as a society? Uh, Japan Society Northwest has been going since 2004. And since that time, it has been putting on regular events, uh, usually maybe about one a month, um, which means that we've been going for a very long time and we have put on an awful lot of events. Um, Japan Day itself, we put on every two years. And that is kind of like our showcase event, um, an event that we put on intimate, well, between Manchester and Liverpool, um, which usually attracts about 2,000 people. Um, so we are, as far as I am aware, the only major Japan society outside um, London that puts on regular, regular Japanese cultural events. Brilliant. So, so Japan Day is clearly the, the kind of jewel in the crown, so to speak. Um, what other kind of events um, might uh, JSNW put on in a, in a normal year? Is, as I say, we, we usually put on about one event per month, and that goes the whole gamut between, say, workshops to do with Ikebana or um, taiko drumming workshops or lectures or maybe some of the less serious parts of Japanese culture, such as uh, karaben and uh, needle felting, anime, that sort of thing. So it, it's the whole gamut of Japanese culture from um, high culture to popular culture to um, from um, lectures to more um, hands-on workshops. So if, if somebody were interested in joining, um, you know, taking part in these kinds of activities, What's the best way to, to get in touch and um, what sort of packages and, and membership options do you have? Um, we have um, a number of uh, membership options. First, the main one is as an individual, which costs £15 a year. And for that, you get four eight-page colour newsletters and discounts off all our events. Um, we also have joint membership which costs £25 a year, and that's for um, a couple living at the same address. And we have um, corporate membership, which is for um, organisations. That costs £50 a year. And for that, you get three of three members of that organisation can attend our events and receive discounts. And the, the organisation gets three newsletters as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, if are there any restrictions on who can join? I mean, do do you have to be able, for example, to speak Japanese, or is it open to anybody who's who's in the northwest? Yeah, th there are no restrictions. Um, I mean, you can join JSNW basically wherever you are in the country. Obviously, it will be of more use to you in the northwest because that's where most of our events take place. But there are no restrictions on joining. Um, anybody who's under 16 can join with their parents and it won't cost them anything. Excellent. So definitely an incentive there to, to young people to get involved as well. Yeah, that's right, because it will cost them nothing. Um, and as I say, we, we have hopefully events that appeal to younger people. Um, for instance, at our last uh, event at Tatton Park, we had a lot of children take place in various activities. Um, like creating um, kind of little wishes which they could hang on bamboo uh, and um, various other fun children activities. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Tim. How about students? Do we have any sort of special discounts or, or maybe some special membership that uh, you know a student could could take advantage of if they wanted to join? Yes, we do. Um, we have a membership that's especially for students in full-time education. Uh, for them, membership costs £10 and they get the same benefits as um, individual members, i.e. the four eight-page newsletters every year and discounts of all our events. So basically, it's the same as individuals and I think that's a very good price for membership for what you get. Absolutely, absolutely. So students, please sign up. Oh, yes. So uh, 
for the other functions of of JSNW, if somebody, for example, were looking for a, you know a Japanese teacher in the northwest, or a, you know a translator or an interpreter, are there people who are members or organisations who have membership who you can perhaps introduce and could maybe help out in that way? Yeah, the in terms of Japanese tutors, what we used to do, there's a, a, an organisation called the Japan Foundation that has a list of Japanese tutors in the Northwest. Um, to be quite honest, I'm not sure um, the last time that I've seen that list, how comprehensive that list now is. Um, currently, we used to advise people to consult that website and consult web um, tutors on that website. But also we have people who are members of study groups in Liverpool and Manchester who can advise people about more informal ways to learn Japanese. And we also have, of course, uh, members who are good at Japanese and people who have taught Japanese as well. So we've got quite a large range of resources and quite a lot of different groups and tutors that we can give advice on as well as course of just advising people to use social media, uh, our social media channels to ask if there are any people who could give them advice about tutoring. Brilliant. Um, and for those social media channels, um, where's, if, if you know, we want to find JSNW online or, or get in touch with you by email, what are the best uh, places to do that? We, we have um, a Facebook group and a Facebook page um, which is under Japan Society Northwest. We also have an, an Instagram page and a Twitter page as well, all of which um, will um, post details of upcoming events and all of which will accept queries from um, anyone, either members or non-members. Coming up next, we have Sumie Kent at 2.30. Um, Sumie Kent is a Japanese koto player based in Dewsbury uh, near Leeds. We've been very fortunate to have Sumi play at a number of um, Japan Society Next Northwest events, including at our last Japan Day in 2018. So please tune into that. That will be a special performance. Following Sumi, we have Paul Regan, a former committee member who has his own Shotokan Karate Union um, and he will be giving a short demonstration from the, his Warrington-based dojo, explaining some of the history and techniques used in Shotokan Karate. Shortly afterwards, we will have a song by the Press X Band, who are a London-based rock band writing songs based on popular video games and performing covers. Their performance will include a cover of the um, popular city pop song Plastic Love by Maria Takeuchi. You can check the Press X Band out at their Bandcamp page. The link will be in the video's description and on screen. After that, we will have Lee Jenkinson who will be performing Enka at quarter to four. Lee will perform a number of Enka songs and give an explanation of his background and interest in Enka. So please tune in for the next few hours. We get some Brilliant. fantastic acts coming up. Thank you very much, Tim. So yes, everybody, uh, please do stay tuned. Uh, and I will hand over to uh, Sumia Kent with her koto.
We at the Shoto Card Karate Union Toda Dojo keep alive the Japanese cultural and traditional Budo values, those that are closely associated with all Japanese martial art forms. Specifically the values that were at the heart of what was taught by the style's founding fathers. Karate training has structure, and there are three elements that are involved in every class. They are, Kihon, which is the practice of the fundamentals of the basic techniques. Then there is Kata, the formal routines of Karate, which are a set of techniques performed in a specific order. Then there is Kumite, which is the practice of fighting techniques with a partner, through the use of drills and ultimately leading to free fighting and the practice of self-defense. Here we see Sensei Regan and Sensei Preden, who are the Dan Gray Black Belt coaches at the club, performing Rei, which is the Japanese cultural bowing ceremony, designed to show mutual respect for your partner and showing serious intent in your practice. Stretching and conditioning routines assists the students to strengthen their bodies and make them supple enough to perform. Here we see Sensei Regan and Sensei Preetan slowly and rigorously performing their basic techniques, their Gihon. Next we see Sensei Regan and Sensei Preed performing Kumite.
And here we see Sensei Regan and Sensei Preen performing various kata. If this short video has inspired you to take up the noble practice of traditional Japanese karate, then contact Sensei Regan for further information. And because the Toga Dojo accepts members from the age of 6 years old, and with no upper age limit karate is truly a pursuit for life. Thank you for watching, Arigato. Everybody, look at this Gengar I have in my guitar. Ooh. Oh, we're starting. Oops. This song is called Plastic Love by Maria Takeuchi. If you know the words, sing along from home. Solo time.
I have a new single up on my Spotify. Uh, it's a song I wrote about Legend of Zelda. <laughs> I'm Lee, otherwise known as LJ English, and I'm an Inca singer. I'm very happy to be part of this online performance today. I've put together a selection of uh, pre recorded videos for you for this performance. I speak only a, a very little Japanese, uh, so these introductions are in English at the moment, um, with a bit of Japanese thrown in where I can manage it. Minasan konnichiwa, watashi wa LJ English tomoshimasu. Inka Kashu this. This first song is called Ora Tokyo Sa Iguda and is by uh, Yoshi Ikuzo. It's originally performed in the Tsugaru dialect, which I'm told I do a pretty good job of imitating, but I assure you it really is largely accidental. <laughs> Yoshi Ikuzo is from the Aomori Prefecture in Tsugaru. Kono Tawa Yoshi Ikuzo san no Ora Tokyo Sa Iguda. テレビもね、ラジオもね、車もそれほど走ってね、ピアノもね、バーもね、おまわり毎日ぐるぐる朝起きて、牛すりで2時間ちょっとの散歩道、でももね、ガスもね、バスは1日1度来る。ほらこん
de danara, zene kwata me de, Tokyo de beko kao dai. この方見たことね、喫茶もね、集いもね、末端の若者より一人、ばあさんとじいさんと、地図を握って空を拝む、薬屋ね、映画もね、たまに来るのは紙芝居。ほら、こんなもらいやだ、ほら、こんなもらいやだ、東京へ出るだ、東京へ出たなら、ザネコあっためで、東京でバチャーしくだえ。レーザーディスコ何者だカリオケはあるけれどかける機械を見たことね新聞もね雑誌もねたまに来るのは回覧板信号もねあるわけね俺の村には電気がねほらこんな村やだほらこんな村やだ東京へ出るだ東京へ出たなら背にこわとめで銀座に山顔だえほらこんな村やだほらこんな村やだ東京へ出るだ東京へ出たならゼネコ温めで東京でベコ顔だえかっ Is titled Ringo Oiwaki and is arguably one of Hibari Misora's most famous songs. It's from 1952, and there's another link to Tsugaru here、uh, in this song. In the spoken passage in the middle, which is performed by my friend Izumi san、uh, on this one, there's a reference to、uh, Mount Oiwaki in Tsugaru. Tsugi no uta wa Ringo Oiwaki desu.
お母ちゃんのことを思い出しておなおら「つがる娘は泣いたとさ」「つらい別れを泣いたとさ」「りんごあの花びらが」From 1957, and it's titled、uh, Minato Machi Jusan Banchi, which is hard to get your mouth around. It's actually one of the first Enka songs I ever heard, and I, I really just I love it. This. One of the things I really love about Enka is, is just the, the rich, beautiful melodies of it all. It's just a big, full soundscape. I really love it. Now, this song's titled Cape Shioya, if you translate it roughly into English, and it's a really beautiful song. Cape Shioya is on the northern side of Osaka Bay.
This song is called Midare Gami and is another very, very famous Enka song in Japan. It's a challenging song, but I just love it so much that I had to give it a go, I had to try it out. Now this song also mentions, if you listen out for it, Cape Shioya, again, just like the previous one did. Kono uta wa Midare Gami desu. This one's a short song, but uh, but I really love it. It's titled Kurumaya-san. It's a lovely mix of uh, jazz and enka combined. Kono uta wa Kurumaya-san to you. Joy to machi o Kurumaya-san. Omae mikon de tanomi ga nozanzu kono tegami. Nai 
は聞くだけやぼうよ歌の文句にあるじゃないか人の恋じやを邪魔するやつは窓の月きさえ憎らしい車屋さん。それでどうしたの、車屋さん。お前さっぱりお役に立てないお人柄。内緒で渡して内緒の返事が内緒で来たのに、どこへやったのさ。へえ、忘れてくるとは、そりゃあまりよ。歌の文句にあるじゃないか。あてにならないお人はバカよ。あてにする人。元バカ、え、車屋さん。Hello, I'm LJ English, and today I'm singing Hibari Misora's O Mae Ni Horeta. みなさんこんにちは。私は LJ English と申します。今日、ミソラヒバリ様のお前に惚れたを歌います。よろしくお願いします。俺に決めろよ、迷わずに。いて振り向きやついてく。
Titled something like Melancholy Wharf, if you if you translate it into English, I'm sure it's more beautiful in Japanese. It, it's one of my favourite Enka songs of all time, this one. And the lighting in this end video is purple because um, that was Hibari Misora's favourite colour, so it's a bit of a tribute. Saigo no uta wa Aishu Hatoba desu. everybody for watching i hope you enjoyed that and i hope i get to sing for you again pretty soon thank you very much minasan arigato gozaimashita Thank you very much. That was Lee Jenkinson uh, performing uh, those anchor in Japanese there so brilliant performance there. Thank you very much. Next up uh, we have uh, Angela Davis, um, who was the first CIR, that's co Coordinator for International Relations, to go out on the JET program to Kagawa Prefecture um, in Japan. She's maintained her links with Kagawa Prefecture over the years, and she is now 
uh, representing Kagawa overseas as the Kagawa ambassador. Uh, we're very lucky to have her here today also as a member of uh, JSNW to just uh, tell us a little bit about um, the smallest prefecture in Japan. So, um, Angela, first up, where exactly is Kagawa and where is it in relation to, say, Tokyo or Osaka? Is it easy to get uh, across there? Well, it's um, Kagawa prefecture is south of Tokyo, south of Osaka. Um, it's on the fourth island of, of uh, Japan, which is called Shikoku, as many of you will know. It's not that difficult to get there. If you arrive in at Osaka Airport, Kansai Airport, there is a limousine bus that will take you straight to Takamatsu, which is the capital city of Kagawa Prefecture. Is there any airport in inside Kagawa that, you know, if anybody wanted to fly in, say, from, from Tokyo? Yes, there is a domestic um, and international airport at Takamatsu. You can fly from Tokyo. You used to be able to fly from Osaka, but they've discontinued that flight. Um, there are international flights as well from, um, from China and from Korea. So uh, it's, it's quite a little hub there for Shikoku. So uh, you mentioned the Kabuki in, in April. What's a good time of year to, to go to uh, Shikoku, to go to Kagawa and, and see what sort of things would you be able to see in the different seasons? Well, like most of Japan, the best time to go is, is, is April to see the Kabuki. Um, also, if you go in November, in autumn time, the, there are some wonderful temples dotted around Kagawa. And um, in fact, there's the, the famous, most of the famous 88 temples are in Kagawa and around Shikoku itself. If you go in autumn, the, the, the colors of the maples are just so, so breathtaking. It's worth going to see them. Excellent. I think some people may have heard of um, one of the islands. So there is, of course, the Nawashima Island, um, which is famous for the, the Benesse um, Art Museum. Could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, visiting the islands in the Inland Sea, what to do on Nawashima and also, you know, any of the other islands around uh, in the vicinity that you can reach by boat, um, which are, are nice to sort of take a, a day trip or to visit? Yes. Well, from Takamatsu, the main city, once you've got to um, Shikoku, you can take ferries to most of the islands. Um, some of the islands actually are not inhabited, and you, but you can get to them um, by yacht or by canoe, uh, and really worth a visit because they have lovely beaches. Naoshima has become very famous as an art island. There they, there's uh, museums and lots of artifacts dotted all around the island the very famous um, Chichu Museum, which houses uh, some lovely port paintings by Monet, the, the, the watercolors, also um, items by uh, Walter de Maria, and some very interesting um, items by James Turrell. Very, very well worth a visit. Um, in addition, there are the, the famous um, pumpkins, black and yellow and black and red. Uh, but, and you can see them when you arrive in, in, in the harbor at Naoshima. In, in addition, there has, they have beautiful beaches there. And there is the, the wonderful hotel Benesse, where if you have enough money, you can stay <laughs> because this is so splendid and magnificent. And the food is, is, is amazing as well. And the views around the island are spectacular. The other island to visit is Shodashima which has been twinned with Athens because of its famous olive trees. They have some very old olive trees there. Um, and it's, it's an interesting island because it, I just mentioned the 88 temples. They have a mini 88 temple walk on Shodoshima. So for, for the faint hearted who can't do the whole trip, you can get around there in a couple of hours. That's very well worth doing. So you, you talked about uh, the Benesse House um, Art Museum, which is on Nawashima. Um, obviously, it, it's quite a high budget um, place to stay. Are there any other options um, on the island itself or maybe in, in um, you know, Takematsu? Are there places where perhaps somebody who's maybe traveling on a, a slightly lower budget would be able to, to stay? Oh, yes, there's, there's lots of places and there are more, many more places now on Nawashima. Uh, sort of B and B or um, Airbnb even, and the there are minshuku, so traditional Japanese houses where you could stay with a family. 
if you go to Takamatsu, which is, the, as I said, the capital of uh, Kagawa, there are lots of business hotels, very, very reasonably priced. Um, so it's not an expensive place to stay. And obviously, you know, when everybody thinks of Japan, we think of food. Um, is there anything that Kagawa is particularly famous for, you know, a sort of local dish that you would recommend people should try when they go over there? Yes, absolutely. Kagawa is a very, very famous for its noodles. Um, they're called Sanuki Udon. Uh, Sanuki is the old name for Kagawa. Um, and wherever you go in Kagawa, all around, there are, there are, there are quite a number, hundreds or so, uh, noodle um, shops and restaurants. And you can go to a very, very fashionable restaurant where you can have different types of uh, noodles to a, a sort of very cheap stand-up place where you could just go in and order a bowl for maybe three pounds or something um, and just eat it standing and then go off on your travels. So um, they, and they're very, very nutritious and very enjoyable. And the secret is of course in the, in the, the sauce, the dashi, which is very important. Um, they make the, many of the houses uh, of, uh, where, you serve, where they serve the noodles, they make their own noodles um, by hand. And this is really a, quite a, an interesting thing to see. And if you're lucky enough, you can actually participate in making your own noodles. So you can, you can make them and, and then cook them and then eat them. It takes a, about three or four hours to make them. And the traditional way of actually kneading the dough is by foot. So they, they, they wrap the, the dough up in, in cellophane or plastic and you use your feet by feet. You, you, you knead the dough to make the noodle. Quite fun, really. So for anybody looking to, to visit Kagawa, is there anything else that you'd like to, to perhaps say to them um, to maybe encourage them to go? Yes. There are lots of wonderful places to visit in Japan. There's, there's no doubt about that. But I think coming to Kagawa is an experience that you will never forget. Not only because of, of the place itself, the friendliness of the people, the wonderful food, the magic of the islands. It's certainly worth coming to see. You, you won't find anything like that in anywhere, anywhere else in Japan. So please come and see it. It's beautiful. Thank you very much indeed, Angela Davis. Um, and also I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to thank the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation for supporting uh, JSNW and for sponsoring us uh, to do this uh, online Japan Day 2021. Finally, we have Catherine Pawasarat from the Clear Sky Meditation and Study Center and Retreat in British Columbia, who will be talking to us about the Gion Matsuri and sustainability. And then after that, we'll be finishing with Kamilady Taiko, who will be rounding off the proceedings with a performance. So, Catherine, over to you.
Welcome. My name is Catherine Poisrat, and I'm the leading non-Japanese expert on Kyoto's incredible Gion Festival, Gion Matsuri. Welcome to my presentation on the Gion Festival and sustainability. Looking forward to the past. Thanks for joining us. I'm speaking to you today from the Clear Sky Retreat Center in British Columbia, Canada in the Rocky Mountains. However, I did live in Kyoto for more than 20 years and I lived in the Gion Festival neighborhood. That's how I started to get involved. So why are we talking about the sustainability of the Gion Festival? Well, you've probably noticed that the sustainability of our entire planet is in question. And I've spent a lot of time at the Gion Festival. I've probably been to it more than 15 times. And I've often wondered what is it that has enabled this festival to continue for more than a thousand years? It began in the year 869. And so many people are involved in putting the Gion Festival on. I also often ask myself, what is it that inspires these people to continue to contribute? year after year, generation after generation, century after century. In a sense, the Gion Festival is a case study for sustainability. There's not a lot of things that we can say have been continuing for more than a thousand years and still continue today. And uh, I have a special interest in, in sustainability. I was a journalist and that was one of the topics that I specialized in. And so I've developed this interest during my time at the Gion Festival as well. Well, I actually get my news from The Guardian. I found it, I find it a good news source. And uh, one of the reasons I like The Guardian is that it doesn't dwell entirely on the bad news. And you've probably noticed that we human beings tend to do this. We dwell on the bad news, what a terrible situation the planet is in and how it's getting worse and likely to get even worse. But what if we look at what is working, what's working well, what has worked for a long time, and we try to build on that and grow that. And I find that the Gion Festival is a great, again, a great case study for something that we can look at and see what's, what's worked, what's worked for hundreds of years, what's worked for a thousand years, what's still working, and how can we take that and adapt it elsewhere, or, or take that and, and develop it within the Gion Festival so that we can ensure that the Gion Festival continues for future generations. And then how can we adapt that for other cultural events or cultural institutions that we love and are challenge, have sustainability challenges, and maybe even to non-cultural events, how can we adapt those? Uh, let's see. So I started at the Gion Festival in 1989 was the first time I went and this image is from 1993. So that's how long I've been going to the festival. And I've changed a lot as a human being <laughs> over those years. I was just a 21 or two when I first went. And I went as a just a visitor to Kyoto. And later I went as a professional journalist, as I said, specializing in sustainability issues and traditional culture. And then while I was in Kyoto, I began a meditation practice and have been meditating for more than 20 years now and became a committed spiritual practitioner. And now I teach Buddhist philosophy and meditation. And the Gion Festival is basically a Shinto event. Shinto is Japan's native animist religion or spiritual practice. It means the way of the gods. And it's very closely related to nature, very closely related to nature spirits. And spirits are energies that most of us can't see. So over time, I became very interested in this aspect as well. So when we talk about the Gion Festival, we're talking about many generations of people, approximately 40 or so generations over more than a thousand years. And it's really interesting to see that multi-generational aspect continue. Here's a, a gentleman 
who's involved in the festival with his grandson. And so in a sense, you can see him passing the baton to this little toddler who uh, doesn't know what he's being committed to. So it's interesting to think many families that I've encountered, I've come to know the people that put on the Gion Festival, and many of them have been involved in their families for as long as the family history endures. And as you can see here, there's a plan to continue that. This, this man's committing his son to a future in the Gion Festival. So just imagine that being committed to something from about the time you're uh, three years old or, or so on. And uh, many people, I have a friend in the festival now who's 100 years old. So it's really, when we say lifelong commitment, we're not exaggerating. So as I spent all this time at the Gion Festival, I wondered what their secret is, what has been the secret for their success, for their longevity. And it started to make me ask the question, I, I was born in the US and now I live in Canada. And of course, the cultural history in these countries is modern history is relatively short. So really, inspired me to ask myself the question, if I were going to commit to something for my entire lifetime and maybe commit my children and my grandchildren or every future generation that I can imagine, what kind of thing would I want to commit to and why? And maybe uh, as Europeans, you can imagine that more easily because your history and your culture are longer. So the Gion Festival is of course not immune to sustainability challenges. And, and we'll talk about these in a moment. And what I'm really interested in, as I mentioned, is how the Gion Festival is rising to these challenges. It's such an ancient institution. They need to come up with new solutions as the challenges change over time. And I find that very intriguing that how such a old institution can continue to innovate and adapt. And so I'm very intrigued by this question, what can we learn from the Gion Festival, how it does this, how this adapts to ensure that it remains sustainable. So the Gion Festival really was founded amidst sustainability challenges. This is a woodblock print of a man who's suffering from cholera. It's in the Boston Museum collections. So, and there's a, a scroll hanging in the background of, of the sick man there. It says Gozu Tenno, and that's the name for one of the main deities that's supplicated in the Gion Festival. He was believed to be able to protect someone from death, basically. Now, in the ancient times, of course, people thought in Japan thought that illnesses were caused by angry spirits. And again, this is a Shinto tradition, the Gion Festival, and Shinto is a kind of shamanism. So we can think of it as a sort of um, maybe possession by spirits or spirits um, tormenting us. Those are the traditional Western ways to look at it. And so purification is very, important in the Gion Festival. So there's a purification of the angry spirits so that they're not angry anymore. There's a purification of ourselves so that uh, we're pure enough that the spirits don't want to bother us. And then there's a physical purification too to free the body from any kind of illness or opposite of well-being. Note also that the Gion Festival takes place every year in the rainy season. And it's very hot, it's very humid, and that's where a lot of these illnesses came from, such as cholera. So here are these men building a float in the middle of the pouring rain, and they really don't have the option to take a break until the rain stops because they've only got a certain amount of time to build the float and they have to do it no matter what kind of weather is happening. And sometimes the Gion Festival does take place amidst typhoons. And of course this year and last year it took place amidst COVID and there were adaptations to that to help protect people from illness. And many people involved in the Gion Festival felt that it really needed to go on because the Gion Festival was founded 
to rid people of epidemics. So there was this, this notion that because of that, the Gyeon Festival absolutely must take place. So, so they scaled it back to prevent too many crowds from gathering to prevent contagion, but, but the show went on as the saying goes. Let's see. And you can see these men walking in the pouring rain. This is during the great procession. It's about a four hour procession. So this is the beginning of the procession. They still look pretty um, well composed. And you can see they're wearing sandals. Their feet are gonna be soaked. Their feet are gonna be covered in blisters by the end. They're gonna be very tired and, and soaked to the bone. So even today, even with modern healthcare and, and so on, it's, it's still a, can be a challenging thing to the participants' health. So notice that the Gion Festival is related to the rain and to flooding, to standing water. But, and due to this relation to rain and floods, weather, weather events, it's also related then to climate change. In 2018, like a lot of places in the world have been experiencing, Kyoto Prefecture had terrible flooding. And as we've been seeing in Germany and in Europe recently, despite all of the amazing technology and engineering that, that Japan has, there was still a lot of damage. A lot of people were homeless. So there was a lot of destruction. So and despite amazing modern technology, that really can't protect us from the forces of nature and from how the planet is changing. So, so then what other approaches do we have? What other potential solutions that we have? And one of the things I'd like to propose and one of the things that I've really seen in the Gion Festival is that one of the things that best protects us is relationships and community. And that's a very, very strong element in the Gion Festival. The community is absolutely essential for the Gion Festival to continue. And the communities really rely on one another. And it's very brilliantly designed so that there are 34 floats in the Gion Festival. The floats are the most famous part. There's other elements, there's the Osaka Shrine and so on. And each float is interdependent. So each float has a certain amount of autonomy, but they also work together and cooperate when they need to. And then when they wanna do their own thing, they have the ability to do that as well. So there's this, even within this ancient institution that in some ways is quite prescripted, it's a World Heritage event. So the, to qualify as a World Heritage event, there's a lot of rules and regulations and yet, they have this ability to, now I'm gonna be somewhat independent. Okay, now we're gonna cooperate with each other and to, to go back and forth like that. And one of the interesting things about an event like the Gion Festival is there's this cooperation in the human realm between different neighborhoods, different human communities, different people. And then there's also this kind of relationship with the non-human realms. So, as we said, the Gion Festival was founded in 869. It was basically a prayer to the spirits, to deities, to bring an end to epidemics. And when I speak about this, I speak about it rather loosely. Not everyone believes in spirits, not everyone believes in deities, but I think most of us believe in, in something, a kind of a higher power or even just the power of belief, the power of aspiration. And so you can say it was a prayer, you can say it was an aspiration, may we become healthy. And that's a kind of link to something that we don't see or, or don't quite grasp. And that kind of community, that kind of relationship, that kind of connection is also very important in the Gion Festival. And I think that really helps it link across space and time as we know it. Remember there's this ancient history. So there's a, a kind of an ongoing link between a thousand years of people who have been doing this. And there's kind of an invisible link to the future generations that are gonna carry it on. And then there's this link with what I'll call the spirit world or the Shinto world, which is very much related to the natural world. So there's a kind of link across space and time between humans and between 
maybe things that aren't human, maybe nature, maybe spirits, maybe aspirations that that help build a resilience into an event like this, into a, a, a very broader sense and more diverse sense of, of community. And it just this is just something to reflect on, on how this might operate in your own life or in events or cultural institutions that you're involved in. So as another example of this, I mentioned I was in British Columbia, Canada, and we've, you may have heard, we've had a summer of record-breaking heat, super high temperatures, and a lot of wildfires. We're actually having a trouble right now with the internet connection dropping because of all the smoke in the air, 15 times higher than the World Health Organization recommends as good for human health. So our response has been to work with nature. Historically, wildfires were not this devastating because the natural environment wildfire was part of it. And we've changed the environment so that wildfires have been suppressed so that when they do happen, they're very devastating. So what we've been doing at our retreat center is trying to mimic the natural environment to try to restore it to what it originally looked at like so that when a wildfire comes probably inevitably it won't be as devastating so this this concept of nature is also in our community and we can work with nature in hopefully mutually supportive ways for the mutual benefit so i encourage you to adapt these concepts to where you live and your situation because sustainability is going to be such a pressing issue moving forward. And in this case, talking about the Gion Festival, cultural sustainability, because we humans do have a tendency to take what we love most and sort of love it to death. And it doesn't need to be that way. So how can we get creative and innovate new solutions so that the things that we love can continue? Okay, so some of the uh, challenges I'd like to talk about. The Gion Festival for many centuries has really depended on the kimono industry. It takes place in the center of the kimono universe. And the kimono uh, industry collapsed after the bubble economy. And the Gion Festival, one of its nicknames used to be the Kimono Festival. And it is historically a tradition to wear kimono to the Gion Festival. You can see a couple doing that here and enjoying a kimono being displayed in the Byobu Matsuri, the folding screen Matsuri when local families and companies display some historic treasure, treasures. So in this way, actually relatively few people wear kimono today, but this is an interesting example of the small things that individuals like us can do to help support traditions. So I started wearing kimono and yukata sometimes to the Gion Festival. And I, I was quite embarrassed about it. I always put it on wrong. And um, someone tells me and I'm like, oh no. But people have said, oh, I like your kimono. I'm gonna wear kimono too. And a friend of mine sa said, I got a new kimono. And, and she said, I've been meaning to get a new, new kimono also. So we can have this, epidemics aren't the only form of contagion. We can have contagion of these good traditions or, or revitalizing these older traditions and in very simple ways help that spread. Another challenge of the Gion, the Gion Festival is facing is the massive crowds that to go to enjoy, oh, this is me in kimono. This, this gentleman is a kimono producer and he actually, that's an antique kimono that I'm wearing and he liked it so much that he reproduced it, which he was very, he said, I can't believe that a gaijin is wearing a kimono that I wanna reproduce, but it's true. So even us non-Japanese can, can be a force for good. And in that sense, we really are, translators and interpreters and, and diplomats, right? We can help by mirroring back what we love about these traditions to, in this case, to J Japanese people or Kyoto people. So there are such massive crowds at the Gion Festival. This is Yoyama, the night before the major procession on July 17. And it that is one of the challenges to the Gion Festival. It's 
can be quite difficult even to be at the festival when it's this crowded. And of course, if you're there with your children and, you know, you're worried about getting separated and, and so on and or with your friends. And so the Gion Festival community came up with a really nice solution, which was they put it into two parts which it actually was in two parts originally, but it was consolidated into one in the 1960s. And so they used separating it to feed two birds with one hand, which is they were able to restore a tradition, which really helps the Gion Festival make more sense. It's about the day greeting the deities in the first part and bidding them farewell in the second part. So the festival having a real meaning that can be demonstrated is, is very helpful for its sustainability. And then the crowds were also divided, not exactly into two, but into two thirds and one thirds, making it a more pleasant experience for everybody. Now, uh, real estate values are another challenge in the Guillaume Festival. It's very profitable to have, say, a parking lot instead of a traditional building in the Gion Festival neighborhoods, which is kind of a mar to the cultural cityscape. And some, there are still historic buildings remaining, but inheritance taxes are very high. And then some of these families don't have children, for example, so they don't have someone to pass it on to, or maybe they only have daughters. And uh, the daughters aren't really trained to manage the estate, for example. And then there's also modern buildings, of course, going up. A lot of apartment buildings, a lot of hotels. Oh, this is one of the beautiful historic homes that's remaining. And you can see on the left here, this is the Minami Kanonyama neighborhood. And on the left here is a, a large hotel that uh, took over from a traditional restaurant. And ironically, then people want to stay in that hotel because it's in the middle of the Gion Festival neighborhood. Or in the case of apartment buildings, a lot of people from out of town want an apartment in the middle of the Gion Festival neighborhood so they can go visit. But because they're not a part of the community year round and they don't have that kind of connection with the Gion Festival, in a way, that's what I mean about loving what we love to death. So it becomes a kind of consumer item rather than a community-based event or organization that, that we're all helping to support. So this is a really interesting challenge, and this is definitely experienced in many parts of the world in different contexts. And so what can we do as, as people who love these institutions? Well, one of the things that I'd really like to suggest is that we rethink our idea of community and that we rethink our idea of, in this case, festival visitor. So when we go, we're not just a tourist, we're not just a visitor, but we're a temporary guest, we're a temporary member of that community. And then if we reflect on this, if I'm a temporary guest or a temporary member of this community, how do I want to show up for this event? And then how we show up really changes. So we're not taking an extractive view, what can I get from this festival? But we're thinking about how, what kind of exchanges can I have with these other members of the community? And I can tell you the Gion Festival community really, really appreciate that kind of thoughtfulness and consideration and being treated really like human beings or, or like hosts of the festival, which they are, because some people make the mistake of thinking that they're paid, which they're not. It's almost entirely a volunteer event, really done for the love of it. And people don't know this, so they come and they think that they're paid staff and they say, hey, where can I put my umbrella or here, please take my garbage or without the please often. And so of course, if you were a guest, or if you were a member of the community, you, you might still have those needs, but you would ask or you would inquire in a different way. And uh, they, they really, the members of the Gion Festival community, the, the full-time members really do appreciate that kind of consideration. And I'm sure that anybody involved in any kind of 
cultural festival anywhere in the world would as well. So as I mentioned, the Gion Festival is a very inclusive festival. It's partly for us humans, but it's partly for the deities. So these are three Mikoshi portable shrines at Yasaka Shrine. And the one in the middle there is for the storm god. It's also for his wife, the goddess of wife, his partner, the goddess of rice. And the third deity is their many children. And the Gion Festival is, is really a great show of reverence for these three deities. The storms, although they can be devastating, that's what helps this life-giving rice to grow. Uh, and of course, rice is such an integral part of Japanese culture. Now, if we take a closer look at the woodblock print that I showed before, if you look in the background there, that kind of gray flume of, of smoke, you can see there's a fox in there and there's something that looks like maybe a goblin or a ghost. So, so there's this concept that the illness this man's suffering from, that the cholera, that there are other entities involved with this illness. And I think the closest thing that we come to today in maybe in our understanding of health and in psychology is that if, for example, if we have a, a bad attitude, that's hard on our immune system and we're gonna be more subject to stress and, and illness that goes along with that. And conversely, if we have a good attitude, we have better relationships, we get along better with people, our immune system is more robust and, and we're healthier. So in a sense, these are kind of the same belief system looked at in two different paradigms. So I'd just like to make that link that, uh, Although we feel like we don't believe in these old things, we, we've really just taken a more modern perspective. Okay. Now in the Gion Festival, although it's super traditional Japanese, there are actually many of the world's wisdom traditions present. Here is an image of a Taoist master showing his spiritual mastery by, by riding a fish through the oceans. And this is just one example. There's examples of Islam, of Christianity, of Western paganism, uh, Greek myths, of Zen, of Mahayana Buddhism, and so on. So in a sense, the, although they have a reputation for being a homogenous society, the Japanese are spiritually very inclusive, very open-minded, and, and you can kind of imagine them collecting all these different philosophies and belief systems and methodologies, figuring whatever might help. <laughs> because, because the Gion Festival is about ridding the population of epidemics, I, such as COVID, it's really about alleviating suffering. And that's what all the world's wisdom traditions, all the, all the spiritual traditions have been trying to do for these millennia. Okay, so the Gion Festival is, continues to change and modernize. Recently, we've been seeing the introduction of women, or I, I believe reintroduction of women. Um, my, my theory is that women did participate uh, and not just my theory, um, some scholars hold that women did participate perhaps in the middle ages. And you can see these young girls who are um, trained as musicians, Gion Festival musicians. Now, one little girl, at a float that doesn't allow women to participate, uh, asked me, she was giving me a survey for her high school project. And she said that her float was suffering a shortage of musicians. And did we have festivals in my home country? And if so, what would I do if, if our festival had that problem? And I said, well, I would probably double my pool of potential musicians by allowing the participation of women. And it was really neat to see her 
of course, that's a topic within the Gion Festival, but when she saw it as a, a kind of international phenomenon, I think that was a new perspective for her. It allowed her to see it from outside the very traditional Kyoto perspective. And so I think everyone watching has some kind of role to play in terms of translation or interpretation, whether that's literal or explanation and uh, diplomacy. And I, th I think that we can really play positive and powerful roles that way, just through conversations like that. And uh, in, in my case, education. Most of the ideas that we're talking about here, I've written about extensively on my website, guionfestival.org, and also in my book on the Guion Festival. And I invite you to explore further and also to continue this conversation through social media, because it's really through hearing about your perspective and what your interests and your questions are that I can develop this more richly. Okay. So again, I wanna to return to the power of community. And this has given me so much reflection for how I show up in, in community and in other contexts. I'm, I'm not officially a part of the Gion Festival community, but you can imagine as the leading non-Japanese expert and as someone who spends so much time there, like I do, I do feel a part of the community. I have many friends there. And here is uh, one neighborhood in uh, Kita Kanonyama, the Kita Kanonyama float with a really strong commitment to preserving the traditional feeling of the festival, which is a challenging thing to do with, with these real estate pressures and so on. And you can see the result, you can see what a pleasant experience it is in this image to, to be in that environment and other neighborhoods are, are following suit. There was um, another neighborhood, this is Hachimanyama. They got together the neighborhood community and kind of did an informal inventory of who had what kind of family treasures or uh, business owned treasures and then collaborated to do an attractive display for the public. So this is one of those displays. One of the homes uh, puts these family heirlooms out every year for the public to enjoy. And then that becomes an amazing source of pride for the community and uh, helps the, the community, it, it helps them have a, a kind of communal joy and a communal pride. And then they're sharing this with other members of the public. So that feeling of community, that positive, healthy feeling of community gets to radiate out and become bigger. Now, different communities, remember I said that each community is kind of interdependent and uh, can sort of do their own thing and also collaborate with others and also stay within the rules. So each community approaches this differently, uh, how, how they wanna show up in the Gion Festival, how they wanna move into the future. One community really works on leadership development and uh, their Gion Festival is an opportunity every year for people who live in the neighborhood to develop team skills and leadership skills and communication skills. And it's, it's quite a beautiful thing to behold. Other ones use the Gion Festival to help focus neighborhood energy on um, architectural conservation. This neighborhood here you saw earlier, Taishiyama, they put out these beautiful benches with red felt and uh, traditional Wagasa paper umbrellas as a way to welcome visitors and give them a pleasant place to sit in the heat of the day. Usually when you go to the festival, you're there for many hours at a time. So to have a welcoming spot like that is really feels like a, a beautiful gift of hospitality. And then this neighborhood, this is Koyama. So you can see this large apartment building on the left-hand side. Uh, so this is something that every neighborhood is challenged with. Uh, so maybe 200 units in that apartment building of kind of strangers, right? Coming from somewhere else. And the Gion Festival community has historically been very insular. You used to have to apply to live in one of the Gion Festival neighborhoods. And so to all of a sudden have 200 plus strangers come in from elsewhere 
could potentially be very disruptive. But the Koyama was very ingenious and they had an information packet on the Gion Festival and a video explaining to everyone about their float, about the Gion Festival and inviting them to participate if they would like. And it's been one of the nice success stories so that new people coming to the neighborhood can take part and support the traditional residents and work together to keep the Koyama float and the Gion Festival and the community spirit alive. So we can get a sense that the education is really important, this feeling of invitation is really important, and that there's also a commitment to invest time and energy and other resources for a longer term gain. And so that's really what we're talking about when we talk about sustainability is being able to take this longer term view and be willing to make these investments for a longer term gain that's also much broader, right? It's not just a personal gain. It's gonna benefit a lot of people even though the expenditure might, might come from here. It, the benefits will come from a broader place. And then of course we get to benefit as individuals too. So a really great example of redefining community came up with the O Funeboko. I first met them in the early 2000s. They were a bunch of musicians playing in a garage, as you can see here. And I asked them what they were doing. And they said, well, one day we want to get a float. And so we're practicing the music for whenever that day comes. And I said, well, when will that happen? And at the time, someone told me it might take us 100 years to be able to build our float. And I just couldn't believe that they were making that kind of investment and that kind of commitment 100 years down the road. And amazingly, they crowdfunded to rebuild their float, Ofune Boko, which had been destroyed in fire more than 100 years ago. And because of that, they actually were able to build their float within less than 10 years. And here's the Ofune Boko on its maiden voyage in 2014. And it was, it was much more successful than they imagined possible. It had, came together much more quickly than they thought was possible. It was this incredible rallying point for the entire Gion Festival community and beyond. The universities were involved, the general public was involved and so on. And so what had been a kind of neighborhood that whose float had burned down and it was kind of the neighborhood was sort of disintegrating a little bit is now a really exciting dynamic place to be. And the community is full of life that you can really feel when you're there because they were able to rally so successfully. So one of the things I, I, another thing that I think is key to sustainability is to really reflect on the original purpose of, in, in this case, the Gion Festival. And as I mentioned, it was established to eliminate epidemics and basically alleviate suffering. And it has become more secular for sure. And I think throughout history, it has always been quite secular. Uh, it's not a major spiritual event in the traditional sense of the wor word, and and that's okay. It that works too, and and yet there are these kind of core elements that still pertain to this notion of alleviating of suffering and and healing and well being. So here, these are yamabushi, a kind of ascetic nature mystic Buddhist sect called Shugendo, and they're preparing a fire puja at uh, one of the floats in Nogyojayama as a prayer for world peace and, and for the prayers that people have written on goma sticks. And that's something, this happens several times every year during the Gion Festival. This is a Shinto dance to please the gods called Kami Osobi that happens at Iwato Yama. So this is a traditional Shinto dance that later gave birth to No. This is a famous No actor, and he comes every year to do this dance in the Gion Festival. So those are kind of formal scheduled events. And then, and then there are people who, this is the woman praying at the central shrine in the Gion Festival. So 
we don't need to believe in any of this per se. We don't need to practice any of this per se, but it is helpful to recall and I think helpful to respect these different belief systems, these different traditions and their purposes. And I think it's helpful to reflect on them. Even if I'm not a believer or a practitioner, what are my beliefs and what are my practices and how can that be a part of how I show up in community? How can that be something that I share for my own and for other people's well-being? And I think that this can really help us lead to a more sustainable generative model for cultural institutions that we love and for our communities. And as I think that you've sensed, education is, is immensely important. Education and using the power of our minds, which as you know, in Japan is located in the heart. The kokoro, the translation is mind and heart, and it's located here in our heart chakra. So learning to direct our minds to think in a way that's sustainable and generative is a really valuable contribution that we can all bring, whether it's to the Gion Festival or to a Japanese aspect of Japanese culture or British culture that you love. So thank you very much for coming. Please uh, learn, feel free to come learn more at my website, gionfestival.org or on my social media channels. If you like and follow, it helps me to share more about the sustainability and generative nature of the Gion Festival on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And um, you're also invited to check out my book on the Gion Festival, Exploring Its Mysteries. Thanks so much to Japan Society Northwest for having me and have an awesome day. Taiko Drummers. It was really disappointing to find out that the Japan Day was cancelled this year, but we're really glad to be able to send you this video. In this video, we're going to introduce to you some of the pieces and we're going to talk to you about the background of the pieces and why we like them. We hope you enjoy the video. Yay! <laughs> Tracy and the newest member of Kaminari. One of my favourite pieces and the first one I ever performed with Kaminari is Yose Daiko. The Yose style is a traditional Taiko drumming style which signifies summoning or encouraging others to join in. So for example as drummers start a festival or an event the Yose style announces the opening and asks people to join in the fun. That's why we often play it to open our first set to get us off to a joyful and energetic start. 
Our version of this piece was taught to Kaminari in Japan by Yoshikazu Fujimoto of Kodo on a study trip in 2012, long before I joined the group. It originates from a hamlet in Akita Prefecture called Nishimonai and is played at the start of the festival there, which is also well known for its traditional dance. I love the upbeat tempo and also the way the two teams play together and then separately, moving apart and back together again with the flute melody leading the way. I hope you enjoy it too. So my favourite piece to both watch and play is Oggy Matsuri. Oggy is a city located on the um, island of Sado and it's a small fishing port and Matsuri means festival in Japanese. This piece is often played at Japanese festivals and it was at one of those festivals that the members of Kaminari um, saw it being played and decided to add it to our repertoire. It was one of the first pieces that I saw Kaminari play and as it was so full of fun and energetic, it made an impact and was hard to forget. It's less structured than our other pieces and therefore allows each member to add their own flair and personality. We always have fun playing it, so I hope you enjoy it too. So my favourite song is Indian Summer, um, I really like it, I like the rhythm, I like the real lilting rhythm, I like the dance that goes with it, it just feels very relaxed and it's fun to play and I particularly like the idea that it's a, a mishmash, so it comes from a bangra rhythm to begin with. It was taught to one of our group members who was a hand drummer on the djembe and then he passed it on to us on um, taiko, so yeah, my favourite. <laughs> Thank you. 
Mary. I'm one of the founder members of Kaminari. Uh, I want to talk to you about Hachijo style. Hachijo is a style of drumming rather than a piece. Uh, it originates from the island of Hachijo, which is about one hour away from Tokyo by plane in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, on the island, Hachijo style drumming is a type of community drumming. It's played at social occasions and, and social events um, and everybody is welcome to join in. It's usually played as a duet. So you have a drum horizontal on the stand and two people play either side of the drum. One person plays what's called the shita uchi, which is the bass beat, the underlying rhythm, and the other person plays the ua uchi, which is a solo, and usually the solos are improvised. What I like about Hachijo style is that it's very individual and everybody plays differently. It's really interesting to see how the individual personalities come out when people are playing. It's also very welcoming and if you go to a party on Hachijo Island, everybody's encouraged to get up and play. Traditionally, uh, Hachijo style, because it is not um, a religious form of drumming, um, has had more female players than male players, which also makes it very interesting to me. Thank you. Hi there, I'm Chris from Kaminari and uh, my favourite piece of our repertoire is called Nordic Thunder. It's based on a, a Swedish folk song rhythm that we've adapted and one of the nice things I think about this piece is that we've written it ourselves based on that, uh, that particular rhythm. The other things that I like is the, the interaction and the interplay between the high-pitched shime drums and the lower-pitched nagados and then the, at the beginning where there's a gradual introduction of, of players and in, 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 you know, building um, and then in the second half where there's a this, this underlying um, rhythm um, which gradually builds towards the end very dramatically. So that's the reasons why I like this particular piece.
John. Um, the piece I've chosen is a piece called Yukiona. I love it because it's really different and adds something unique to our theatre shows. It's really atmospheric and it tells a, a classic story from Japanese folklore of the snow woman, Yukiona. It deals with lo lots, it's, it's in lots and lots of films and books and animation and there's different um, legends but most of them have Yuki on killing various people in woods with their icy breath. We've created our own piece that captures the story and somehow I ended up being Yuki on It's really good fun to act out and the percussion for the group is amazing. It's beautiful but creepy uh, and it's got full attention. It rises and falls like a heartbeat until the very final scene. If you like Japanese mythology and legends, then you're gonna love this piece. Yuki Ono. My name's Tony from Kaminari. Uh, my favourite Kaminari song is Oni Daiko. Um, Oni being Japanese for demon, it's our demon song. Uh, the reason I like this song is partly because I get to wear a long wig in public without being laughed at, which is obviously a good thing. Um, but the main reason I like this song is the background to it, and it actually draws on two different aspects of Japanese culture and tradition. The first one is the Setsuban Festival, which is held every year on the day before spring. Um, there's a lot of traditions around this. One of the main ones is the bean throwing. And people throw beans in order to, to cleanse the area of demons and prepare for a successful spring ahead. So they throw a handful of beans, they shout, Oni wa soto fuku wa uchi, which means demons, devils out, and good luck, happiness in. And then after they've thrown the beans, um, they eat the number of beans that corresponds to their age. Um, and that's the ritual, so it's kind of like a, a spring cleaning for demons really. Um, we don't throw loose beans when we play, because they're a bit messy, but we do throw little packets of jelly beans, so um, if you're not paying attention at that point, you might get one on the back of your head. So that's the Setsuban Festival. The second part of the Japanese culture is the, the style of, 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 the, of the playing and it's known as Gojinjo Daiko. Now this is a very specific style of drumming. Um, it's specific to uh, Ishikawa prefecture, the, uh, the Noto Peninsula, which is on the western side of Honshu Island. And the story behind this style of drumming is that in the 16th century, there was a warlord called Useki Kenshin who landed there um, with his army in order to try and take over Nanao Castle. 
Um, the locals weren't particularly impressed at this. Um, but how were they going to defend themselves? They had no equipment, they had no arms, they had no training they, against an army of soldiers. What on earth were they to do? So what they did, they peeled off some tree bark and they stuck it on the face in the style of a mask. And they got some seaweed and put that in the hair as if it's a, a big wig. And they got all their pitchforks and all their farming equipment and they basically banged anything they could, made a right noise, shouted, drummed. Um, and the army saw this from a distance and they had no idea what it was. It was such a horrific sight, they'd never seen anything like it before, never heard anything like it before. And they, they ran for it, they retreated and the, the locals won. They, the fishermen, the farmers, they chased the army away. And that, that's where this style of drumming originated. It's still played there now. Um, masks are still used, not from the 16th century, but very old masks are still used. And the story is that the masks are passed down from generation to generation. The same masks are worn and the masks um, are the contain the spirits of, of the previous generation so they, they can contain all the spirits of the, of the people who've worn them in, in, in the past and who have now passed away. So it's kind of a, a cool story. So that's the story behind Oni Daiko. And there we are, Oni Wasoto. Thank you very much to our last performers, Catherine Parasarit, based at the Clear Sky Centre in Canada, and Kaminari Taiko, who have closed out the event with a terrific summary of the history of Taiko. Thank you to everyone who's tuned in today for our first Japan Day Online. Several long nights of production and editing later, and with the support of all of our performers, I hope you've enjoyed the showcase we've put on today. As I'm sure you're aware, JSNW planned Japan Day to take place at the Liverpool Guild of Students back in 2020. But due to the pandemic, this has now been postponed until 2022. We are still looking forward to hosting next year in person in July at the Liverpool Guild of Students. I'm very grateful to all of our performers today who have provided material for us at such short notice and have been patient with us as we've tried something that the society has never really tried before. And so thank you to Liam Morgan on the Shamisen, Tengu Taiko, Sumie Kent on the Koto, Paul Regan from the Shotokan Karate Union, Dr Mobius from the Press X Band, Lee Jenkinson performing Enka Singing, and of course, Catherine and Kaminari Taiko for closing us out. We'd also like to thank the support from the Great Britain Sasakawa Foundation and the Embassy of, the Jap of Japan in the UK, as this event is part of the Japan UK Season of Culture for 2019-2020. I've been the producer for this event, and it's been a great pleasure to bring together so many of the talents we've seen today. Whilst this isn't our first online event, it certainly is the first of this scale and of this magnitude. We started our foray into the online world back in 2020, 
when, since when we've held a number of Zoom meetings and seminars. We've had a talk on the reparation of traditional Japanese prints, a talk about Lolita fashion, and we held our annual general meeting online with a quiz about Japan. As well as this, we launched our collaboration lecture series with the JET Alumni Association, of which we've completed two so far and have a few more planned for the future. In the next few weeks, we'll be uploading these to our YouTube channel, so please make sure to subscribe when you can see when we add those. We've really learned from this that we have an active online community and one that we want to continue to develop in the future. In the plan for the next year, we'll be looking at updating our website so our members and community can join in the conversation and keep track of our upcoming events. I'll put some pictures up of the draft design for the new website uh, here in the, um, the video so you can get an idea of what's coming up for us online. Coming up in the near future, we'll be continuing our online events but also returning to our in-person events in the Northwest over the next few months. This month's event at the, Tatton uh, at the Tatton Park Japanese Gardens was well attended and gave us the chance to reconnect with some of our members. We have a number of in-person events planned for the near future, including a sushi workshop and more to be announced. If you're a member, make sure to keep checking your emails in the latest newsletter as any upcoming events will be listed there. If you can't make it to the in-person events, don't worry as we still want to introduce Japanese culture to everyone online. You'll see more updates coming from our YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter and our website, all of which will be on screen and in the description below. In particular, our Facebook group with over 2,000 members is one of the best places to talk about Japanese culture in the northwest of England. Um, so please make sure to check out the link to that group to join the discussion. If you've enjoyed everything and anything you've seen today, please check the video's description. Uh, links and more details for our performers today are down there, as well as the social links for society. If you missed anything today, today's performance won't be going anywhere. You'll be able to view it on our page once we close out the event. And so with all that, I'd like to close out the event, and once again thank everyone who's taken part, as well as everyone who's watched us today. If you'd like to get in touch with us here at Japan Society Northwest about any future events or to join the Society, all the details are in the description below. As a reminder, as a member, you get four newsletters a year from us and free or discounted access to our many events. So thank you, everyone. And to all our performers, Otsukare-san Thank you.